Two Kinds of Knowledge August 9th, 1979 No matter how sophisticated and advanced the world's knowledge may be, it can't eliminate the world's suffering and hardship in the same way the knowledge of Thamma can, because Thamma always imparts peace and coolness. A world without Thamma is a world of Dukkha. Regardless of how much you may have studied, this mundane knowledge will never get rid of the Dukkha inside your heart because it's not intended for the removal of Dukkha. Only the knowledge of Thamma taught by all the Buddhas can do this. If you study and practice the Thamma, you'll definitely achieve the results of Thamma. Although worldly knowledge and Thamma knowledge are both considered knowledge, they are different just like how males and females, although both human beings, are different. You can always tell them apart by merely looking at them. It's the same with worldly knowledge and Thamma knowledge. They have different features and purposes. You can tell them apart if you study and practice Thamma. On the other hand, if you haven't studied and practiced Thamma, you won't be able to tell them apart. How could you? You'll only know about the world, and will think it's the greatest place to live, to excel in fame, fortune, honor, influence, and power, although your heart is actually empty of them and is always hot and burning. No matter how high and mighty you may proclaim yourself to be, it won't make you truly happy. You mustn't therefore think that you'll find true happiness by only learning worldly knowledge. In whichever time and place, and in whatever class or society of people this Thamma is established, it'll always impart happiness to them, corresponding to the intensity of the Thamma that has been developed in them. The Thamma is therefore indispensable for the world. Thamma should always accompany every undertaking if you want to benefit from it, whether it's for yourself, your family, your society, or your country. Without the Thamma, you'll end up with pain and suffering. The reason why there isn't any true happiness in this world is because there isn't any Thamma. Looking inside your heart, you'll see, whenever you think about all the troubling events happening in the world, your heart will be consumed by them. The more you think, the more troubled your heart will become. You can gauge your Dukkha by your thoughts. When you don't think about troubling events, your jitta will be calm and peaceful. When your jitta experiences the samatha or tranquil tamma, even at the beginning stages, you'll be awestruck. Samatha means tranquility that arises from your tamma practice and produces true happiness. The aramrna, or feelings, generated by thinking about tamma and thinking about the world, differ greatly from one another. Thinking about the world produces dukkha and suffering, whilst thinking about tamma eliminates the gilesas, dharnha, asava, and dukkha from your heart. If you're a tamma practitioner and truly believe in the law of gamma taught by the Lord Buddha, you should closely watch those thoughts that are propelled by the gilesas, dharnha, and asava, because they will give rise to dukkha. Those thoughts and dukkha are inseparable. If you want to think, you should think about Tamma. Refrain from thinking about the world at all times. You should always oppose and eliminate those thoughts. No matter how hard it might be, you've got to do it because it's your job. The Lord Buddha said this is the way he and his noble disciples, or Savakas, eliminated the Kilesas. They all had to endure Dukkha and hardship before they could destroy all the Kilesas. When you go into battle, it's normal for you to run into Dukkha like boxers fighting in the ring do. Even the winner has to go through a lot of Dukkha, not just the loser. This kind of winning, however, will never put an end to your conflicts. But the Thamma's triumph over your Gilesa's will. It's normal for you to run into Dukkha when you have to oppose and destroy the Gilesa's by developing mindfulness and insight. The Lord Buddha was the first one to experience this Dukkha when he collapsed from his exertion. It's the same with the Savakas, or noble disciples. If these Dukkha experiences were normal in the past, how can you expect otherwise? How can you become enlightened without going through this Dukkha that the Lord Buddha and the Savakas went through? It's unavoidable. 
You've got to run in the Dukkha as you follow the footsteps of the Lord Buddha and the Savakas. They had to experience Dukkha, so must you. They were fighters, so must you be. It can then be said that you're following your great teacher, the Lord Buddha. You mustn't be deceived by your thoughts and feelings that are created by the Gilesas, and mustn't obey them, but must always defy them. Tamma is your weapon that will identify and destroy all the Gilesas. Tamma is your weapon that will identify and destroy all the Gilesas. Sati, or mindfulness, is the Tamma that will protect and support you. The Gilesas will appear in various guises when visual objects, sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile objects come into contact with your heart, where you'll always notice them and oppose them if your Sati is ever present and you're really determined to fight them. Sati is the indispensable Tamma that will always take care of you. You shouldn't be idle and unmindful. You might think you're relaxing, but actually you're being complacent and waiting for the Gilesas to do you in. This is not good for you. What's really good for you is when you're killing the Gilesas, which is your most important mission and duty, because this is your goal and the reason you take up the robe. You've experienced the worldly life before you took up the robe and know that it's mixed with poisons. You can't trust the taste of worldly life to always give you happiness, but you can wholeheartedly trust the taste of Tamma. You're now putting your trust in and relying on your Tamma practice to always provide you with happiness. The four requisites of living, food, clothing, shelter, and medicines, have all been abundantly provided by your lay supporters. They willingly offer their supports out of their sadha or faith and respect, so you don't have to worry about them and be distracted from your exertion, which is your only task, the task of eliminating all the gilesas, using the various means and techniques devised by your own common sense and ability. None of the other tasks are important or vital for a samana, one who has gone forth and follows the Lord Buddha. You shouldn't deceive yourself into doing any other tasks because you think they're attractive or worthwhile. Developing worldly things isn't as important as developing your heart so that it will give you contentment. Although you may be living in a small hut with the roof leaking, you'll find it comfortable and free from worries. When you leave the hut, you won't worry if anything should happen to it. You're not seeking for fame or fortune because that isn't worthwhile even if it's fashionable. It's just a fad, not the real thing. The real thing is the Lord Buddha's teaching. If you faithfully follow his teaching, you'll always find security and fulfillment even if you're living in a shack. Sati is indispensable in the battle between the Gilesas and Tamma. Most of the time, it's the Gilesas that destroy the Tamma due to the lack of Sati. You must therefore be very mindful. This is your task. I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart and from my profound appreciation for the Tamma that I realized from my practice. I've always faithfully followed the Tamma teaching, like the one that says Rukkamula Se Nasanang, living in the forest, which is an ideal cultivating ground for someone who aims for freedom from Dukkha by continually investigating Geza, Loma, Naka, Danda, and Tatsu, or head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, and skin. This is Tachapanjaka Kamatana, literally translated as a list of the five body parts, with the skin as the fifth part. What it actually means is the skin that wraps around the body and obscures the heart from perceiving the body's true nature. Even though it's very thin, it can completely cover up the truth. The Lord Buddha taught us to investigate the five gamartanas in both forward and reverse order. When you get to the skin, you must then dissect the skin and look at the flesh and the innards to see what they look like. You've already seen the external body parts, now you want to see the internal parts. If you only look at the external parts, you'll always be deceived. Looking under the skin will give you insight to the true nature of the body. You should repeatedly investigate these body parts back and forth, like the farmers who rake and plow their fields back and forth again and again until the soil is ready for planting. You shouldn't use the number of times you have investigated to measure your result of the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana, 
but you should use your ability to skillfully and repeatedly investigate until truly seeing and letting go of the body as a measurement of your success. When you've truly seen with Banya the body's true nature, you'll naturally sever your attachment to the body. This is Sandir Tiko, seeing the truth by practice. This is the bhikkhu's occupation, your occupation. You should always keep this in mind. Don't waste your time working like people in the world do, such as building temples, monks' living quarters or buddhis, assembly halls or salas, and then forget to do your thamma practice that will keep your heart calm, peaceful, and cool. When you don't practice, you'll feel bored and restless, and be driven to do some other kind of work, like building shrines and pagodas that don't promote peace and calm, but disarray and trouble inside and outside the monastery. Inside the monastery, it troubles the monks or bhikkhus and novices or samaneras. Outside the monastery, it troubles the lay supporters. It'll strain the relationship between the laity and the bhikkhus, who are punya ketang lokasa, the best people to make merits with. Instead of cooperating, they will oppose each other. The sangha or the community of monks now turns into vampires instead of being the best people to make merit with. So how can this lead to peace and tranquility? Think about it. It's because the bhikkhus aren't sticking to their occupation, which is to develop morality and the jitta to perfection. You need Satibanya to constantly look after your jitta, and you should never be without it if you want your jitta to become worthy of adoration and reverence. It isn't beyond the disciplining ability of Satibanya. The Lord Buddha prescribed the forty meditation subjects or themes or kamatanas for each practitioner to choose from, depending on his or her character and disposition. They are the basis of your mental development and your most important undertaking. To see the body's true nature, you must use the five gamartanas, that is, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, and skin, or the entire thirty-two body parts as your objects of investigation, whichever you prefer. These body parts are with you all the time, so why can't you see them? How was it that the Lord Buddha and the Zavakas were able to see them? Their eyes were similar to your eyes, their hearts were similar to your heart, and their satipanya was similar to your satipanya. The reason is that they correctly used their satipanya in their investigation for the truth. By following faithfully the Tamma teaching, they were able to remove their delusions and became enlightened. Their mission was to eliminate the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava, which is the same mission for all bhikkhus because it's their real mission. You should resolve to complete this mission by tirelessly investigating with your Satipanya and shouldn't see other undertakings to be more important because they will lead you away from peace and contentment or the Samarnathamma, the Lord Buddha's teaching. You already have adequate living requisites to fill your needs, so you shouldn't be concerned with them, because it will just needlessly disturb you. You should instead concentrate all your efforts on your meditation practice, no matter how hard and difficult it might be, because you're now on the battlefield. If you're having difficulty fighting the Gilesas, you should ask yourself, why? Why can't the Chitta calm down? What causes the jitta to be restless and agitated? What kind of thoughts is the jitta being obsessed with? You should then use your thoughts as the object of your investigation to see their true nature. This will then lead you to the jitta that's being deceived by your thoughts which keep generating ideas and concepts to entangle and bind the jitta to your thoughts. This is the way of doing the investigation. But first of all, you should calm your jitta with satipanya. The jitta will eventually calm down because it can't resist the power of satipanya. It's the same way with all types of gilesas. They can't oppose the power of satipanya. Tamma is always a superior opponent. It's the tool for training and disciplining the jitta and the tool for the eradication of all types of gilesas. But when you apply tamma in your practice, it's the gilesas that are knocking you down. Why? It's because you haven't developed enough tamma yet to be able to catch up with the gilesas. Therefore, you shouldn't remain idle. 
You should use your Satipanya to devise different methods of investigation to gain insight into the Galeas's nature and attain to the various Thamma levels that are the consequences of your investigation and contemplation on the various Thamma themes. This can be any part of your body or other people's bodies that come into contact with you. You must investigate to see them as repulsive or a sulpa. Both your body and other people's bodies can be used to develop the Magga, the path to the cessation of Dukkha. It's these Sankharas or thoughts that can generate either Magga or Samudaya, the creator of Dukkha. But normally these Sankharas are manipulated by the Gilesas and become the creator for Samudaya, and this has always been so. There's no question about this. In order to make these Sankharas the Magga's weapon and deliver you to freedom, you have to train these Sankharas to work for Thamma. If the Jitta doesn't calm down, how can you, a bhikkhu, find any happiness? If your jitta is being burned with the Gilesa's fire of lust, hatred, and delusion, what then is this world, this body, and this existence good for? If you're always depressed and despairing, how can you make your life meaningful and worthwhile? You have to rely on the meaningful and worthy tamma to eliminate the worthless Gilesa's, which are the main culprits that make your life worthless. When the Gelesas are destroyed, calm will appear. In the beginning stages of practice, calm is very essential. If the jitta isn't calm, you'll never be happy because you'll be smoldering with the fires of lust, hatred, and delusion. You are not noble because you put on the yellow robe. What's noble about this yellow robe? There are plenty of them in the shops. It's only a symbol of your noble life and lofty goal. What's a bhikkhu's goal? It's the removal of the Gilesas, and not the accumulation of the Gilesas. It's not his goal to remain idle in the midst of the fire of lust, hatred, and delusion. His initial goal is to be always calm and cool. Then he must investigate the body to see that it's made up of the four elements. It's a nitsang, gukkang, and anatta. It's repulsive, or a sulpa, and it's filthy, or partikula. This body is full of anitang, dukkang, and anatta. You must concentrate your satipanya to investigate the body to see clearly its true nature. You shouldn't presume that you'll always be living and studying with your teacher because you're living in the world of impermanence or anitang. So whilst you're still living and studying with him, you should concentrate all your efforts in getting rid of all the gilesas. When you have any questions, you can ask your teacher. I'm always ready to answer your questions and to advise you on your meditation practice. Besides instructing you, I'm also waiting to hear about the results of your practice that you've got to see and experience yourself. When you do, it's unavoidable that there will be questions, especially when you're developing banya. Some of these questions or problems you'll be able to solve yourself, but with some others, you'll need your teacher's assistance as you steadily advance in your practice. For this reason, the Lord Buddha called his students Savaka, which means one who listens. You've got to listen to his teaching in order to know how to practice. Only the Lord Buddha is a Sabbanyu, a self-enlightened one. The Savakas have to listen first before they can become enlightened. You're a Savaka, one who listens, so you must listen to his teaching and have it deeply embedded within your heart. You mustn't just merely listen, for this is like splashing water on a dog. No matter how much water you might splash on it, it'll shake it all off. It's the same with the Tamma teaching that is being splashed into your heart. You can shake it all off with the Gilesa's power. If you listen unmindfully, it will be impossible for you to retain any tamma in your heart and acquire the satipanya to free yourself. This is not the way for a serious practitioner who aims for freedom from dukkha to listen. If you do, you'll be like pork on the chopping board. I have great concern for you, and that's why I have to constantly give you these instructions. I don't see anything in this monastery as valuable as my students who are studying and living with me. I think of the benefits that they'll acquire after they've developed themselves to perfection and then help propagate the Lord Buddha's teaching. 
which will happen naturally and inevitably. But now you should only be concerned with developing and training yourself to establish a foundation in Tamma and to have complete confidence in yourself. The benefit for others will follow, just as in the way of the Lord Buddha. He first concentrated all of his efforts in developing himself and paid no attention to anything else. After he had become enlightened and completely freed from Dukkha, he then took up the duty of a teacher, teaching Tamma with love and compassion until he finally passed away. By his example, the Tamma teaching has been preserved and passed on right down to the present. The benefits for yourself and others are therefore inseparable. All the noble disciples or sadhakas have all followed the example of the Lord Buddha to their utmost ability. They benefited others as much as they could. If you aren't enlightened yet, how could you teach others to become enlightened? It's not possible. If you blindly teach, how can your students see the truth? Your students won't benefit from your teaching. If you only know the theoretical tamma and not the practical tamma, your teaching won't enlighten your students but will only provide them with speculations that will lead them away from the right path. This is in great contrast to an enlightened practitioner who can teach with complete confidence because he teaches what he has experienced and realized within his heart. So, how can he blindly teach when the truth is clearly manifested within himself? His students will be able to listen with complete confidence. That's how the Thamma was propagated during the Lord Buddha's time. Therefore, the transmission of the practical Thamma is different from the theoretical Thamma that can only describe the Gilesas inside the heart, but can't destroy them. This is useless. You've got to see the truth because it's distinctly different from the theory. Descriptions of the Gilesas, Tanha and Asava and Magga, Pala and Nibbana are very different from the actual experience. The description can't terminate the Gilesas, but the actual experience can. When you've clearly seen the Gilesas' true nature, they will all disappear. Be sincere and earnest. The Lord Buddha's Tamma can be clearly realized within your heart. Don't relent in your exertion, but intensify it. If there's Dukkha, you must endure it. Every living being has to experience Dukkha. Don't be deterred or weakened by the Dukkha that arises from fighting the Kilesas, because it won't kill you, but will make you victorious. This Dukkha will help you eliminate the Dukkha created by the Kilesas and remove all the Dukkha from your heart. So, how can this Dukkha be unbearable, discouraging you until it defeats you? If you can't face the Dukkha arising from your practice, how will you face the Dukkha created by the Gilesas? As a practitioner, you have to think rationally. You can't make food out of Satipanya because it's only good for eliminating the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava. Listening to a Desana or Tamma talk given by an enlightened teacher is considered by those who practice mental development to be the first priority. If you're developing calm, your jitta will calm down very easily whilst listening to a desana, even if you never had any calm before. If you're continually mindful of the sound of tamma flowing into your jitta, the jitta doesn't think about other things. Normally, it's the jitta's habit to think aimlessly. Even when you're meditating, you can still think aimlessly because your thoughts are more powerful than your sati, which, in the beginning stages of development, won't be able to stop your thoughts. When you listen to a desana, you should focus your attention at the sound of tamma flowing into your jitta. This will prevent you from thinking aimlessly, and consequently your jitta will calm down. You'll see that it's a lot easier to develop calm by listening to a tamma talk than meditating by yourself. If you've already established a calm foundation, you'll swiftly and easily enter into calm. Sometimes, when you've entered into calm, you'll let go of the sound of tamma and your jitta will remain still without the need of a controller like sati. This can also happen. If you're developing banya, when you listen to a discourse, the jitta won't remain still, but will actively follow the discourse because it's banya's nature to be always investigating even when you're alone. When you listen to your teacher's desana, Banya will follow it closely as if your teacher is clearing the path ahead of you. 
When he comes to the topic of your investigation, you'll attentively listen to the explanation that he will give you without any hesitation because he has already understood it. After you've heard his explanation, you'll also understand it. That's why I truly believe that it's possible to become enlightened whilst listening to the Lord Buddha giving a discourse. How can I not believe this when I have experienced it myself? Who can teach better than the Lord Buddha, who is considered to be the greatest teacher? Next to him were his noble disciples or savakas who were also enlightened. Everything they taught was all true and came from their practical experiences. If you listen to a Tama talk given by an enlightened person, you can become enlightened. If it's given by an unenlightened person, it'll be filled entirely with speculation, and you won't gain any benefit. The discourse or desana given by a theorist is different from that of a practitioner. A theorist doesn't know the real tamma. What tamma he knows is all fake. The jitta is where you'll have to eliminate your troubles. You shouldn't look elsewhere because the main culprit is the jitta that's constantly creating troubles for you by ceaselessly thinking about the past and the future, about visual objects, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects, about good and bad, right and wrong. No matter how long ago things might have happened, it'll keep thinking about them and become happy, sad, or disturbed. You're deceived by the Gilesa's trickery, by their manipulation of the five kantas, their long-time servants. You've got to make the kantas the tamma servants by eliminating all the gilesas from your heart. After you've achieved this, the five kantas will become the tamma's exclusive servants. But they will remain active because it's their nature. This is especially so with sankara and sanya. Sanya is much more subtle than Sankara because it permeates quietly like ink into blotting paper. Sankara has to stir before it can think. Sanya just quietly spreads out to form a mental picture for Sankara to conceptualize with. It's natural for Sanya and Sankara to remain active even without the Gelezas to manipulate them, except when the Jitta rests in Samadhi. However, whatever they do will have no effect because there's nobody to be affected by them. But if they're manipulated by the Gelesas, they'll become a problem. If they're not, they will keep on creating mental images and thoughts until the dissolution of the body, when they'll come to a complete cessation. These five kantas will continue to function after they are free from the Gelesas, like a lizard's tail which has been cut off that still goes on wriggling as if it's still alive when in fact there's no life in it. These five kanthas will continue on, because the jitta still possesses them, although the jitta isn't attached to or deluded by them. When you hear a sound, you'll be aware of it, because the ears and the sense awareness or vinyarna still function. As soon as you hear the sound, it'll disappear if you don't grab it and become attached to it. It'll appear and disappear. These kanthas will only become still and quiet when the jitta rests in samadhi. When they temporarily stop functioning, all that remains is just the knowingness that seems to pervade the whole universe, like a sound that spreads in all directions. This is due to its greatness and grandeur. Nothing can penetrate it or influence it. It can't be created through your imagination. It's so subtle that it can't really be compared with anything. Even though you might know what it's like, you just won't be able to describe it. It's as if the world and the universe have all disappeared. All that remains is just this knowingness, striking and imposing. You can't pinpoint where this knowingness is, and neither do you care to. What for? When you know you can't locate this knowingness, you just accept that fact. This knowingness has no other characteristics except this undeniable knowing, which is its true nature. It has no desires, no cravings. To it, nothing is too much or too little. Everything is just right. This knowingness is so vast. It seems to be embracing the whole universe. It's also so empty. It seems devoid of the whole universe because it doesn't have anything to do with it. After you've emerged from this samadhi, all the mental phenomena or nama kandhas, like feelings, memory, thoughts, and consciousness, will reappear. They'll appear and immediately disappear 
and won't become a long chain because there are no kilesas to connect them. There are no samudayas to create dukkha for the chitta. You can use these mental phenomena any way you like while you're still alive. You've got to see this for yourself. What I'm telling you may sound incredible to you. When you've seen what I've seen, you'll see what I mean. This is what the genuine truth is like. The jitta has now become constant or unchanged. You can't say, how come the jitta is like this today? How come the jitta was like that yesterday? This won't happen. You'll clearly see that it's the gilesas that cause the jitta to change, to become this and that. These changes, whether they're coarse or subtle, are the gilesas conjuring tricks. After you've completely eliminated them, there's nothing left to deceive you. The jitta remains the same, day in and day out. As far as the years, months, and days are concerned, they're just conventional reality or relative truths that have no impact on the jitta. The jitta sees them as merely a passage of time and events from day to night, from sunrise to sunset. What is there to be deluded about? The earth that you walk on is just the earth element. In your stomach there's plenty of the water element. Your body keeps breathing the air element in and out. The fire element keeps your body warm. They're just elements. Why be deluded with the concept of I and mine, human beings and animals? Why create these concepts to contradict the Tamma? To defy the Tamma is like walking on thorns. You must see in accordance with the Tamma. If they are just elements, you should see them as just elements. If you see according to the truth that the Lord Buddha taught, all your problems will be solved. Be really earnest and sincere. You must destroy all the Gilesas because they are harmful to the Jitta. Your thoughts and imagination are also harmful because they are instigated by the Gilesas. It's the same with your presumptions and suppositions, but after you've completely eliminated the Gilesas, you can think any way you want to. It won't do any harm because you can control your thinking. You can prompt it or restrain it. These kantas become like tools that you put in the proper place after you have finished using them. When you want to go to sleep, you just shut them off. When you want to enter into samadhi, you just restrain all your thoughts and feelings and enter into the state of knowingness, where you can rest in peace and bliss. And that's all there is to it. When the time comes for their dissolution, you're ready for it, because you've thoroughly investigated them. You won't get excited, because you know that death is just the disintegration of the four elements. You won't feel like wanting to die or wanting to live. Both the aversion to death and the attraction to life are one and the same thing. Why go on living when it's time to pass away? Why try to resist it? This reminds me of the Lord Buddha, our wise and great teacher, during the time when the Venerable Sariputta came to bid him farewell as Venerable Sariputta was about to pass away. Had the Lord Buddha requested the Venerable Sariputta not to pass away, but to live a little bit longer to help him teach the Tamma, then this would be encouraging him to remain longer in the Vartachakka, or cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. If the Lord Buddha didn't want him to pass away when death was imminent, it would be resisting death. Had he said, go ahead, then it would be encouraging death. The Lord Buddha advised that when the time was right for Sariputta to die, let it happen. This was the most appropriate advice. In saying, when the time is right, he meant Sariputta should let death happen naturally, following the law of nature that Sariputta had already investigated. In this way, he wouldn't be resisting the truth. He could have said, go ahead, pass away, but when it's not yet the time, why pass away? That's why he said, when the time is right for you to go, go. When it's not yet the time, stay. But before you leave, you should give a Tamma discourse. The Lord Buddha said this to the Venerable Sariputta, and the Venerable Sariputta understood that the Lord Buddha had given him the permission to display his teaching prowess and supernatural powers. After he finished, he then took his leave. The Lord Buddha then gave permission to about 500 bhikkhus and samarneras to accompany the Venerable Sariputta to his birthplace for his passing away. 
The point here is that the Lord Buddha didn't request the Venerable Sariputta to live longer because it would promote the Vartta Chakka existence and would defy the law of nature. But if the Lord Buddha had said, go ahead, it would be another extreme and would be contradictory to the truth. That's why the Lord Buddha told him he should let the Kanthas break up naturally. It was the same way with the Venerable Moggallana when he came to bid farewell to the Lord Buddha, which was seven days after the Venerable Sadi Buddha, if my memory doesn't fail me. The Lord Buddha gave the Venerable Moggallana the same advice and the permission for him to demonstrate his teaching prowess and supernatural powers. First he gave a Tamma talk, then he flew up to the sky and back down to earth to give another Tamma talk and repeated this feat several times. The Lord Buddha also gave the Bhikkhus and Samarneras permission to accompany the Venerable Moggallana as he left for his passing away. During the Lord Buddha's time, Magga, Pala, and Nibbana were plentiful amongst the practitioners. There were many who were imbued with the Magga and Pala, the path and fruit. But when it comes down to our time, there are only people possessed with fake Tamma. There are only the names of the Kilesas and of Tamma, but the real Tamma, be it Samadhi or Banya or Rimutti, is not there. Who's going to bring back to life the real Tamma of the Lord Buddha? Who's going to apply the Madhima, the middle way of practice that is suitable for achieving the Magga, Pala and Nibbana and eliminating all the Gilesas which oppose the Magga, Pala and Nibbana? It must be you, the practitioner. You should only be concerned for and look after yourself. Always remind yourself to practice. Don't remain idle if you don't want to remain ignorant. You should devise various methods and techniques of banya to fight the kilesas and gain insight. First, you have to nurture your banya until it can investigate on its own without being prompted and will relentlessly investigate to the point where you'll have to restrain it. Considering Uttatta, one of the higher sangyojana or fetters as described in the texts, I wonder what was in the mind of the person who recorded this. This is not trying to find fault with him, but the text reveals his state of mind. That is, was he free of the Gilesas, or was he still possessed with the Gilesas, for describing Uttatta as a mundane state of restlessness and agitation as classified in the five mental hindrances that can occur in any mundane or worldly person? Because this Uttatta is an obsession with the investigation where Banya has gone to an extreme. That's why it's categorized as one of the higher fetters or sanghyodzana that also includes mana, conceit, and avidda, that imposing and resplendent state of knowing inside the heart. This jitta is not really in a mundane state of agitation and restlessness, but it's restless and agitated from being obsessed with the investigation. This is at the level of arahatta magga, the path to arahantship. This is when the arahatta magga is in progress, as soon as this Arahatta Magga becomes fully mature, then the Arahatta Pala will appear immediately, the instant when the Jitta completely cuts off birth and existence. Everything is totally shattered the instant the path merges with the fruit, or the Arahatta Magga merges with the Arahatta Pala. But at this stage it cannot be considered the complete or perfect Tamma or the complete work of mental development. Like when you're stepping up from the stairway to the floor of the building, one of your feet is on the stairway and the other is on the floor of the building. This is the instant when the path merges with the fruit. As soon as your other foot is lifted off the stairway and placed on the floor of the building, at that instant you'll have attained the complete or the perfect tamma, which is Nibbana. When you're lifting your other foot, you're still working. But as soon as you've placed your other foot on the floor of the building, you have completed your work, or achieved the total cessation of dukkha, and realized the perfect tamma. You have achieved the ultimate result. When you're still lifting your other foot, this is the magga approaching the pala. But when both feet touch the floor, it's described by some commentators as the arahatta pala. In fact, this is also nibbana, because the Lord Buddha also mentioned this. Had he not done so, then the Savakas would have questioned why he didn't mention that Nibbana immediately follows Arahatapala. So, with the wisdom of a great teacher, the Lord Buddha elucidated the four paths, four fruits, and one Nibbana, the Magga and the Pala, the path and the fruit, 
are pairs like the Arahatta Magga and the Arahatta Pala. Passing beyond this pair, you can say it's the Arahatta Pala, the fruit of Arahantship. You can also say it's Nibbana. There is no contradiction here, especially with the one who has attained to this state. Anyone can say anything about it, but he doesn't see any contradiction because he has already realized the ultimate truth. The bhikkhus during the Lord Buddha's time were possessed with the Magga and Pala, so how can you be possessed with weakness and laziness?